there's science and technology, and then there's the implementation. The Durham Energy Institute is at its heart a research organization dedicated to the production of clean energy. The generation of heat and light that's sustainable, cost-effective and practical, and that works within a political and policy framework as well. The challenges within that task are easy to underestimate. I'm Andrew Wilson. I'm here in Davos, ahead of the World Economic Forum, to speak to Professor John Gluyas. Welcome to the Business Debate. John Gluyas, welcome. Uh, good to talk to you. Uh, the DEI, I can see that thriving in an academic and scientific uh, environment, but tell us more about your, your public role and your commercial role. Yes, Durham Energy Institute is unusual, maybe unique, in that we pride ourselves, not only do we have academic excellence, uh, not only do we integrate between the sciences and the social sciences, anthropology and so on, but we have very strong links with society and with industry. Uh, one particularly good example of this is the work we've done with a company called Dong. Originally Danish oil and natural gas, it was a, a petroleum company like many we know. Over the last 10 years it's morphed, it's changed, it's now known as Ørsted and it's entirely on renewables. And we work very closely with them. They've sponsored links into the university. One of the things we've done, for example, is optimize their harvesting of wind in the Danish sector. We've enabled them to make that transition from fossil fuel company to renewables company, perhaps faster than they would otherwise have done. So you're trying to shorten that bridge between, if you like, R&D and action and policy, almost to the point of becoming a consultant. A consultant uh, implies... Um, almost a, a, one direction of information coming from the, the skilled person, the consultant, the academic, into the industry. Ours is a much more integrated process than that. It's feedback, you know, what works, what doesn't work, can we optimise this? And so uh, it, it is a little bit different from a, a consultant role. Uh, we are partners, we, are, we share, we work very closely with, uh, for example, um, Procter & Gamble in our chemistry department, linking through to their R&D. Is the national, indeed, the international debate on such matters as well informed as it might be? With regard to energy, I think the international debate is uh, particularly ill-informed. Uh, we've got a, clearly a very good uh, organisation dealing with uh, some of the problems over climate change, but the other end of that, the energy side, is very much driven by national uh, and international interests, uh, you know, companies, countries rather, which produce oil or produce gas. Let's, uh, as members of the public, we think of alternative energy simply as wind, tidal and solar. Is it as simple as that? Uh, alternative energy brings in a whole host of forms. What we've been able to do in the UK is really optimise uh, some of the wind harvesting we've done. The offshore is phenomenal. It's now competing on level playing field with others. Uh, solar has become also very important, but it's only part of the picture. Uh, what you've spoken about there really addresses power, electricity. And there's another component, a major component, which is almost um, invisible, and that's heat. In the Northern Hemisphere, UK particularly, half of our all, all our energy requirement is to heat space. And that's hardly addressed. And what sort of direction should we be looking in for that? We know about geothermal technology to an extent, but other than that, people tend to fall back on the old fossil fuel technology. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, with regard to heat, uh, for example, in the UK at the moment, something like 70%, 77% of all the heat we generate comes from burning fossil fuels, either directly in our homes with gas boilers or indirectly producing power in the power station and sending electricity down the line. When we produce power in the power station, depends which sort of power station you've got, but between 30 and 50% of the energy is lost as heat. And yet we're not utilising that heat as we might. Combination of waste heat and geothermal energy in the ground means that we could, we could look after the UK in terms of heat requirement for at least 100 years. But we need to get that image through to policymakers. OK, so talk me through some of those examples. Uh, so one of the things we're working very uh, closely with at the moment are our industries, councils and other interested bodies in the northeast of England. And the northeast of England, of course, has a background of coal mining. We have, what, a thousand years maybe of coal mines throughout the UK. 
Most of those coal, in fact, all of those coal mines are now abandoned and flooded with water. The water has become warm. We can use that warm water as the base level heating in our cities. That it can be done has been proven in Eastern Holland with the city of Heerlen, entirely heated by geothermal fluids. So in your experience, what's the inertia between where we are now and exploring those ideas? Is it simply investment? Is there political risk involved? <coughs> With regard to why we don't adopt these alternatives, um, my own opinion is that much of it is the inertia of, we've always done it this way. You know, we've made boilers in our homes 95% efficient. Uh, the fact that the overall process is much less so almost escapes us. Uh, it's the inertia around doing something we've always done. The fear of something slightly new, even though the technology is actually pretty damn straightforward. You know, it's been known about for decades or so, but we do it one way. But individuals, individual homes and households, and sometimes larger organisations, explore on a, on, a, on a personal level uh, options for themselves, biomass heating, thermodynamic heating and so on, but no one's talking about putting in an infrastructure in any particular country where that might become more widespread with people the option, giving people the option to buy it. Well, that's not... Yeah, I'll challenge you there, Andrew. It's not certainly true. A number of uh, nations have got very well-developed uh, heat networks, um, cities like Copenhagen, even Beijing are developing them. I think where we've lost out of it in the UK is because we've had the benefit of, first of all, town gas and, and North Sea gas. But when it comes to infrastructure, think of the massive change which occurred in the 60s around the changeover from localised town gas to North Sea gas. We can do it. We just haven't done it in quite a while. And when you take these ideas to policymakers, how do they respond to you? Uh, just a week ago, I was down in Parliament talking to one of the uh, special interest groups there. And it, the, the story around heat became something of a, a revelation. We had significant buy-in. So I'm just hoping that that little seed planted there will start to sprout and we'll be able to deliver uh, sustainability, affordability and security for the UK by better exploring heat options. So if you had the platform here in Davos with the undivided attention of all the eminent members of the World Economic Forum, what would your message be? My message around energy for sure is uh, whilst oil, gas and coal remain core, we've got to start to explore low carbon alternatives much more uh, openly than we're doing at the moment. It's not all wind, it's not all solar. Think of heat and there are a myriad of ways in which we can deliver heat. Heat from the earth, heat from industry, all will contribute towards reducing the quantities of greenhouse gases that go into the atmosphere. We can make that 1.5 degrees uh, upper limit if only we embrace heat. And in terms of optimism or pessimism, is this a race against time? Are we falling behind? Uh, we are falling. Undoubtedly, we've seen the recent um, climate change reports. We are falling behind. But there are some... Uh, gems on the horizon. I think uh, one of the most interesting ones to develop currently over the last few years has been this consortium from the petroleum industry, Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. It brings together multinational companies and national companies, national companies from China, from India, from Mexico, and they're recognising that we can't do business as usual over the next few decades. It has to change. It has to move away from the fossil fuels uh, instead of fossil fuel companies, we'll start seeing more and more energy companies, and that will embrace things like geothermal. John Glias, thanks very much indeed. Good Thank to you. talk to you. Thank you.